Um, I've been trying to train an agent, uh, and people are using this word agentic, um, I guess as an adjective, um, uh, trying to train um, software to, to have uh, agency um, or goals and things like that. And LLMs are actually very good for that. And a lot of people, um, there's a Japanese engineer, I'm going to butcher his name. He and many others, and certainly uh, I can't be the only ones that are thinking really hard about, well, how do we give machines agency and give them sort of an interest in doing something. And LLMs actually provide an unbelievable ability to do that. So OpenAI, if you sort of ask OpenAI, get, you know, my, you know, you are, you know, John and, and John needs goals in his life. What, what are the goals that you would suggest? It very quickly will, will come up with goals. And that's something that, you know, you could then put in, in LLM, LLM again and say, well, well, how would you go about achieving those goals? And you keep recursing. Uh, so the guy's name is Yohi um, uh, Nakajima, and he's on, uh, on Twitter, Y-O-H-E-I. He's probably one of the best people in this space to follow. So if you haven't followed him, it's Y-O-H-E-I, Yohi Nakajima, J-I-M-A, uh, yohinakajima.com. He, he writes a bunch of essays. He has a VC fund, I believe, called Untapped Capital. And he's been actually investing, but also writing software <laughs> uh, on, on how, do you, how would you create this sort of agentic model. And again, I, I couldn't understate enough the, the, the seismic shift of, of you know, uh, in essence, civilization. Uh, <laughs> there's not many inventions that would redefine mankind or humankind uh, but this is one of them. Uh, this is uh, one that, that uh, would, for the first time, recreate the pecking order of, of mankind as well, which, again, you know, th that's bigger than the Internet. That's bigger than the telephone or the transistor or fire or the wheel. <laughs> you know, those are all things that, that maybe enabled us to get to this moment. And that's the whole idea of the singularity is that you have this double or second derivative that's, that's positive And as acceleration continues, you know, we'll reach this sort of point in time that, we'll never be able to sort of rewind from. And I think that scares a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people wonder what that world would look like. And, and if it's a one-way door, as Jeff Bezos would say, you know, that you can never close again, maybe we should just take our sweet time and really enjoy this side of the door. The problem is, what if you're 50 years old or 70 years old, <laughs> you know, and, and you're not going to see the other side of that door? Uh, one of the other problems is, well, what if the other side of that door is utopia? And a lot of people are asking, what if the other side of that door is hell? Um, and we just don't know. But, you know, the thing about that door is that we can't really escape it. <laughs> we, we can try to stop it or delay it. But, you know, I don't think that, that this cat's ever getting back in the bag. I think that people uh, around the world are, you know, at least on my Twitter, are, are mesmerized by this and can't stop talking about it. And I don't think that's going to change. I think it's going to get worse, or, or depending on your perspective, just increase dramatically. And, and we're not going to see this stop. Uh, until kind of we get to that AGI moment, um, you have people like Reed Hoffman um, and others. Uh, John Carmack is a good example, kind of coming out of retirement <laughs> as entrepreneurs and saying, "Hold on, I need to start a company. I need to do something here." And there's going to be this race uh, to be the first person to, um, you know, kind of redefine humanity. And I think that you know, sort of taking a page from Ayn Rand's book, that ego is the fountainhead of of progress, you know, there, there's, there's an interest in people to, for, to be first. You know, I think that for a lot of people in science uh, and in academia, you know, the, the only goal you have is uh, your name, you know, how, you know, do you last? And, and people ask me all the time, you know, what's your goal in life? And I always say that if you can give me one math theorem that would have my name behind it versus all the money in the world forevermore, uh, I would take the math theorem. And, and be able to say that, oh, Shkreli proved the twin prime conjecture, or well, Shkreli proved, you know, class conjecture, or something like that. And, you know, I think Andrew Wiles is sitting pretty there. You know, he, he proved Fermat's last theorem, and no one will ever forget his name, you know, but people will forget who, who the today's billionaire is or tomorrow's is. And so AGI is like one of these goals that, you know, mankind will strive for, whether we try to stop it or not. And um, redefining humanity is just something we can't, <laughs> we can't stop. So... I think that part of the EAC philosophy is a little bit of inevitability. You know, is there really a way to palpably, you know, change things? And wouldn't that change be scarier? Um, you know, there's a saying in chess and in some other places, I think it's one of Gary Kasparov's favorite sayings that the, um, you know, the, the uh, cure is worse than the uh, disease. And, um, in, you know, I think that, you know, to cure this problem, we would need very, very deep regulation, very, very deep kind of, 
uh, surveillance. <laughs> we would have, you know, basically any kind of academic thought or action would then all of a sudden become scrutinized and there'd be some gatekeeper who would say, no, 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 this is not good for society. You must stop. And I think that dystopian world may be worse than the AGI enabled world. And um, one we know for sure is bad. The other one, we're not sure if it's going to be good or bad. So I think that, you know, most academics and scientists and tinkerers don't want to live in a world where, where we're told what to do. Um, and we may have to work in secret or, you know, there've been a lot of jokes in this part of Twitter where, you know, they talked about AI kind of um, and GPU clusters and things like that. I have a friend who runs the, you know, uh, probably the largest independent GPU um, sort of outsourcing shop. And, you know, to even think about that, 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 that kind of a warehouse, if you will, or a data center could be, you know, something that's, uh, you know, a military kind of, um, you know, uh, or security kind of related risks or nation state kind of risks is, is, is like a little bit embarrassing. Um, you have a lot of people that are just trying to do interesting math problems. And I'm not trying to sort of like make apologies for what this is. As I've said, it's, it's the most seminal moment in, in human history in many ways. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, seeing the results and seeing the GPT-4 in the mirror, you know, makes people wonder if, if we, you know, uh, want to stop here or pause here. And, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I know what my opinion is, <laughs> but I also think that, uh, you know, it, it's some time before, you know, um, we'll be there. Um, I do think like people like Yohi, um, you know, uh, have, have the right idea that, you know, we're going to get agency out of these machines relatively quickly with advances in robotics. Maybe you'll even see something that's, that can do things in the physical world. But I think for most part we're safe because most of the IO or input output interface here is, is, is API. And I've been working very hard to make it so that it's not a call and response paradigm. I think that's the one thing everybody's missing. Maybe I shouldn't even be re revealing that or talking about that. But I think that, you know, the, the current paradigm of you call an API and you get an API response over HTTP, that's something that, that's got to go. Um, <laughs> that's not how humans talk. That's not how humans uh, interact. And it's, it's not hard to, um, it's not easy either, but it's not hard to, to sort of get these machines to think about it more like the way we think about it over a socket and you know find the right moment to interject in a chat and if you talk to uh we used to have aol instant messenger and that was like a, a very socket like connection where you can um really feel the other person communicating um and that that app is sort of gone we, we kind of have it a little bit still in sms and, and whatsapp and stuff like that but you know asynchronous communication is is one thing but when you were really synced up with somebody you can sort of tell you can watch them type then they erase, then they stop, then they think again, then they say this, then they say, oh, wait, wait, wait never mind. You know, you get that sort of real feel of, of somebody thinking and talking, and these machines don't do that. Maybe that's for the better. <laughs> but I think that um, they, in, in a room of 10 people, let's say at a party, an AGI would have a difficult time. Every single time the person said something, the response would come back uh, for every single one of the comments that other 10 people are making. And we all know that at a party or in a, in a social setting, you know, uh, I don't know about you guys, but um, most of the time you're supposed to, you know, wait, think, talk uh, sort of at the right times and your, your timing can influence how much people like you or don't dislike you or whatever. And it'd be very awkward if you responded to every single uh, post or every single um, speech act that every single person made. And so I think that's like one more milestone that's very small, but, but important to make. And, uh, you know, agency and, and things like that are, are coming and so what, what will, will happen from the safety side, like I said, this, this sort of call and response API or even my WebSocket API is not dangerous. You know, <laughs> this is the kind of thing that could easily be unplugged, easily canceled, easily deleted. Um, you know, if it starts to make too much trouble, it wouldn't be hard to, uh, you know, press control C and break the, break the cycle. Um, I don't think uh, that's dangerous. I think that, you know, when you get into robotics and drones and things like that, you certainly could, could be looking at something dangerous. But guess what? We have laws. We still have law enforcement. We still have things that, that could stop somebody who wanted to weaponize technology. And people can weaponize technology today. They do sometimes. Uh, and uh, we stop them. And I think that, you know, the, the dangers will grow. But I think that, you know, we'll, we'll be able to catch up with some of that. And, and to some extent, like I said, it's Pandora's box. You know, we're going to have to cross this Rubicon one way or the other. I think we shouldn't cross it with fear, but but optimism and, you know, with a collective spirit that, that technology will make the world better as it always has been. 
and and um, you know this is the ultimate form of technology. So maybe it'll be the ultimate form of betterment. Um, that's my hope, at least, kind of where I think things are going and and how important this moment is. But also, again, putting my financial hat on, I do think we're going to get kind of a bubble of, of epic proportions. Um, it's important for bubbles to sort of have something that people can chase financially. And one of the problems with our current stock market is we don't really have that. Um, it'll be really interesting to see if companies will go public to kind of tap into that. When the internet companies went public, they didn't have any revenue either. And you'd have $5 billion valuations of companies with literally no revenue, just a website. And I don't think that's out of the question here. You know, I think that when it comes to AI, um, such a transformative technology, you know, it, 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 it may be the case that that happens. It also may be the case that the venture community starts to, to put money in at, at very high prices. You know, that's typically what's limited, you know, these companies from uh, staying private, you know, is that the access to the capital is, is the frothiest in the public markets. And that, that'll never change to some extent. But we've also seen like an equilibrium grow between sort of late stage hedge funds and venture capital and, and the IPO world where, where we've actually seen companies, um, I'm thinking of a bunch in the healthcare IT space, that have had their peak valuations in, in private crossover type rounds. So uh, I still think that you know, you know, the public the public markets are, are still probably the frothiest and the best place for, to, to sort of you know go public. So it'll be interesting if you know I don't know how early I, I am in this whether it's six months, a year, two years that we start seeing a, a whole bunch of AI companies go public. Some that were you know pretty much just started right then and there, um, and you know the companies like. Um, the, all the ones we all know, like Anthropic and, and others that are that are private, um, you know, today are going to be like, you know, really, really big IPOs. But, but you know, there's still an opportunity to sort of get in around this and start to sort of be uh, very early to, to what could be a mega bubble, um, the bubble to end all bubbles. Um, <laughs> last thing I'll say, one of the most fascinating things that Kurzweil talked about in his book is that after AGI, money becomes meaningless. And I, I think that's a really interesting point. He basically said that after um, there is a singularity, the machines are able to do all the work for us, and there's there's virtually no resource or you know uh, need to work for anyone, and, and UBI kind of come becomes a um, a new paradigm. And I actually think that we're we're starting to get there today a little bit, um, and I do think UBI is also inevitable. Uh, I'm not sure we will see the utopia that Kurzweil predicted, but I do think that you know I understand his point really well and. The idea that money and property, all those things sort of become like, you know, kind of secondary and, and unimportant. And what does that civilization, what does that world look like? I think we're starting to get there a little bit. I've talked a lot about how uh, financial assets and attention assets are kind of like starting to catch up in value. That the number of followers somebody has could be worth, in a lot of people's eyes, the same amount as the number of millions of dollars somebody has. Um, that, you know, you think about a potential uh, mate and you say used to say, well, how much money do they have? <laughs> and now you might say, well, how many followers do they have? And I know that I've been guilty of, <laughs> of actually asking myself uh, about, you know, uh, people that I've, I've looked at, like, oh, are they popular? Are they, are they famous or something like that? And it's kind of an inventory item that, that you can take, which is even, you know, really, really, you know, kind of bizarre. It's sort of a social currency or social credit um, that's interesting. And so, you know, we, we have seen the ability for, for money itself to be less important in, in this new network state or whatever we're entering. And in a post-AGI world, I wonder if money is, is largely going to be irrelevant uh, because the resources that we, we need to buy, you know, or, or sort of consume will either be provided for or, or you'll have this flattening of kind of, uh, you know, utility where, where money sort of becomes, you know, less sort of important relative to, you know, what, what actual utilities we need in life.